for about the past 40 years, I've said the same thing um, on this day of the year. So I love this weekend. Um, I know you do. I don't know call you do. me. Don't call me. Don't bother me. Leave me alone. Um, now that I have the opportunity to watch Thursday and Friday too, I'll be uh, I'll be in front of my television set because it's a Masters weekend, and it's um, it's John. It's more than a, I don't feel this way about the U.S. Open, the PGA, or the even the British Open. I, I like watching them, but the Masters is something extraordinary and special to me, and um, I, I can't wait. Yeah, I, it, well, two things. I think for most Canadians, it's the beginning of summer or spring, or we've had our last blizzard. Means, yeah, it means the weather's changing. If, if you're yeah. not on the golf course yet, it means you you will be soon. Plus, if you are a golf fan and you never have the good fortune of actually playing Augusta National, you still know the course. And so, yeah. it, 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 so and, and listen, Bob, you and I both remember when we never saw the front nine. We never, you know, there was a, there was decades and decades. They refused to allow TV cameras. We on didn't the front see nine. Amen Corner either. Right. So, so there was, there was a, for, for them to let us see the golf, the whole golf course and see particularly the back nine, Amen Corner 16, um, you know, the walk up 18. We all know it. We, we all know it. We all think that we've, we've lived it. Um, and whether it be golfers that we liked or just uh, the, the tension of that last af Sunday afternoon, it's, it is, it is a magical time. And, and it's, you know, it's, it's got exclusivity. It's got, it's got political issues, but it's still a great golf tournament to watch. If you want the one watching a golf tournament. Um, I, I've been there once. I uh, didn't play, but I watched. I was there for the entire week. Have you been? No. Is it on your bucket list? Uh, not as a spectator, but I'd love to play it. But I know I never will. So. Well, I, I'd still love to play it, but um, just to have been there once, it's um, such no. an extraordinary place. And our, um, our guests, both of whom have been there, one of them played in the Masters. The other one got kind of, as I recall. He got screwed. screwed. He got screwed. He got screwed out of it. Um, both of them were winners on the PGA Tour, which should qualify you well, uh, to, to play at Augusta. You, one should, of them, you should ask Ian why he didn't get it. You should ask. Well, him. one of them got in, and the other one didn't get a chance because uh, of a, a fluke. He got uh, screwed. Two guys that, um, if you're a Canadian golf fan, you know. Um, they are both uh, pals of mine, and I think John's too. Uh, Ian Leggett and Richard Zokel will join us and we'll take a look ahead to the best week of the year. It's the Masters at Augusta, Georgia, beginning tomorrow. And we'll chat about it uh, when uh, the program continues after these messages. Well, the program uh, commences. Uh, Bob McCowan, John Shannon with you, and uh, two guys who will be uh, familiar to um, sports fans and certainly golf fans um, across the country and around the world and up your street. Um, Ian Leggett. And Richard Zokel uh, join us on the eve of uh, the Masters Championship, an event in which Zokel, you played in um, in the Masters uh, one time. Am I right? Once, yeah, nineteen ninety three. And I know you've told me this story, Lego, fifty times, and I never for remember it. You did. You won at Phoenix, but you didn't play at the Masters. Tell me why yeah, again. Tucson. They they had a two year period where they didn't let the winners categories in, so. Yeah, anyway, and I got close uh, off the money list that year. They had the top 10 not otherwise exempt, and I was 11th on the money list going in that week, too. So, uh, but you know, unlike you, Bob, I've been fortunate to play there a few times. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, uh, and I want to thank you very much for the invitation to join you. <laughs> Jerk. <laughs> um, well, here, there's so many things we can say about Augusta National and, and uh, this event. It is, um, it is, uh, it, it's the biggest golf tournament in the world, isn't it? Isn't, Absolutely. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, Zoe can reiterate this. There's no doubt about it there. You know, unless you're European, unless you're, you know, Irish, Scottish, you know, English, I, I, I would have to 
say that there isn't a player in the world, especially on the PGA Tour, a tour player that wouldn't, you know, put the Masters on the top of their list of what needs to be on their resume. So, you know, with that, um, you know, I think there's a lot of guys this week that need that Masters on their resume to validate their career. I think there's a lot of guys that, you know, when you look at a guy like Ben Curtis, for instance, I mean, he's got a British Open on his resume, really almost flies completely under the radar. Nobody flies under the radar when they have a master's on their, on their resume. So I, I think that, you know, it is the event that all tour players, you know, have to have on there, especially if you do want to be validated as one of the greatest players that's ever played the game. Dick, you agree? Uh, I, absolutely. It's it, the master's is that event, that one event that uh, if you're uh, you've been dreaming since you were a little boy, a junior golfer, Everyone, they, you, you, it becomes such an important aspect in your life to view, and then you aspire to play in it. Once you get into it for the first time, you're so overwhelmed with achieving this dream that uh, the biggest um, barrier to performance is you're in awe and you're just trying to calm it down a little bit. And uh, that's uh, because it's such an important aspect in every professional golfer's mind. And uh, Nick, is, is, is there something that driving down Magnolia Lane? <laughs> is there something that that jumps out at you right away that yes. says hey i'm here well i gotta tell you this story it's actually the the monday like sunday before you know you, you get into your into augusta national you get settled in your home you, you're chomping at the bit you can't wait for monday to come around and play that golf tournament and and typically on a, a tour event my wife would you know you get a courtesy car my wife would drive me to the golf course for the uh, you know to to start the event and it's seven o'clock on Monday morning and a typical tour event. No one's there at seven o'clock in the morning. And I remember we're driving down Magnolia Lane. My wife just got her, you know, it's seven o'clock, 630 in the morning. And we're driving up there. She's in her, um, you know, jogging outfit, no makeup, no. And we're driving down and there's like 10,000 people around there. as You come around that circle and she goes, holy blank. <laughs> She's freaking out because she's got to get out of the car. There's 10,000 people that are clapping. It's just a surreal situation. And she gets around into the car. The car's running. She's trying to start it. And she's freaking out. It was such a funny experience. And uh, actually, I was talking to her this morning about it. And uh, she goes, yeah, I absolutely remember that. It, uh, it was a horrible experience for her. But those, uh, it's, a, it's such a big impact to all players. Well, and I, I have been to Augusta for the Masters. Um, I obviously haven't played the golf course, but to speak to your point, uh, Richard, um, one of the unique things about it is there is, it's sold out every year and literally sold out. And if you don't have a ticket, you are not getting in. And there is no reservation of stands and things. So people bring their their chairs, their green chairs, and they are there. Literally, they go at the, they're lined up before the doors open right. hundreds, maybe thousands of them lined up to go in and put their chair somewhere, whether it's at 16 or wherever right. they want to be, they put their chair down there and then they leave and might come back four five, six hours later, but their chair is there. So they have a place to sit. Well, Those things that always drove. There's an absolute protocol that is uh, an honor is involved in, and that's what you're talking about, Bob. Yes, it uh, it's been very deeply established there. Yeah. Um, what the 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 supremeness of the Masters is it at least in part or entirely because it is the only one of the majors that is played at the same site every year. And it is a site that is not just familiar to golfers, it's familiar to every golf fan in the world because we all watch it. U.S. Open goes from course to course, British, PGA, same thing. Is that part of the intrigue, Lego? Yeah, I think so, absolutely. And I think the exclusivity, and which is, what's interesting too is, you know, and I think to the betterment of the game, they have legitimately declared themselves as a stakeholder. And that is going to improve the game of golf. And they're slowly removing, if you want to call it that exclusivity and the, you know, the anonymity of, of what the Augusta National really is, the mystery around it. 
by the drive, chip and putt, and now the Augusta National Women's event. They are opening the door to allowing people to see behind the curtain. Who knows where this goes into the future? But I think in the very beginning, um, you know, a- as golfers, we love the game. There are these places in the world that are almost untouchable um, uh, to a, you know 99% of the golfing public of the world and the Cypress points and you know the places like that around the world. And Augusta National is the very top of that. Um, so, but as they start to open up the door a little bit, I think that exclusivity starts to drop down. Um, we're getting to hear more and more about Augusta National. And I think this is all stemmed from allowing women into the club removing the um, discriminating practices that they had of the past and really opening the game up to, you know, like I said, they have declared themselves um, as a stakeholder in the game. And I think that's going to be great for the game of golf. Um, One of the other intriguing things, I don't know if you guys have experienced this. Well, maybe Lego as, because you've played there uh, as a, um, you know, a pedestrian. Um, one, what does one that of the make things, you then if you haven't been there? well one of the things that, <laughs> one of the things that's intriguing about it is i mean i went i went to i think it was 95 it was crenshaw won that year it was right after harvey Pinnock had passed away as his longtime teacher and um the the decorum of the of the patrons as they like to say i don't i could say fans because they can't kick me out but they like to call them patrons, the decorum of the patrons and the economic reality at that time, a week pass, because I had a week long pass, had a face value of a hundred dollars. Um, a, a pimento cheese sandwich was a buck. Um, they didn't gouge you in any way, shape or form. It was, it was, it was like Walmart, um, you know, in terms of what you had no, to no. pay to go in that what you just said would get you kicked out too. So that would just get for the record. Well, he's yeah. already used, he's already used guests and Walmart. Now there's no <laughs> chance of you playing Augusta. Now. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. can we talk about the golf tournament? We're going to get, <laughs> we're, we're talking on. about the place, you know, a couple of guys who have been there. Well, no, but, yeah. Hey, listen, so, so, but the key question is of all, if you, if you put the top 10 golf courses in the world on a list, where's Augusta? Not on mine. I, no. I think that... <laughs> we, golf Zoke, tournaments. Zoke's, yes. a, Zoke's a little bit of a no, snob. No, no, so no golf. <laughs> I knew that would spark something. That was the whole golf adventure. courses. When you talk about golf courses, mm-hmm. how good is this golf course? Not the event, not the tournament, not the festivities, not the fufara. How good is the golf? Shani, 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 listen, I should have preempted you on this conversation. So, you know, I don't know how long this show is going to be, but go ahead, so. Yes, yes. So I am of the opinion that uh, 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 Augusta, if someone were to build the exact replica of Augusta National today, it would be the last job they ever got. Um, keep in mind, the golf course, in my opinion, used to be a remarkable golf course. They'd come in and, and artificially change on a regular basis. They tried to tiger proof it. The greens are in excess. Um, it fits perfectly for the, the masters tournament, but the golf course, uh, there are, it, there's, it, from a pure golf course architecture point of view, it wouldn't be in my top 10. But, um, but and, and that's shocking to most people. I have no problem. Uh, talking against um, Augusta National in a number of their areas. Uh, so, but it's one of the, the greatest tournament that I've ever played in. So mm-hmm. um, keep in mind, there's um, everyone falls in line with them and they have a lot of dough. They have a lot of power. And, uh, but um, I, I, I will take the other side of the argument in, in a number of ways as it relates to it. So it's looking like Shani, it's going to be me and you playing Augusta. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine. Well, I, 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 I'm fine to never play it again. I've been there, done that, and uh, that's okay. You know what I lend this to? And Zoke and I talk about architecture all the time. And we, we, we do actually agree on most. But I think when I look at the, you know, you look at Pinehurst number two, for instance, and you, when you read the Donald Ross Chronicles and those, the courses at Pinehurst, 
So Pinehurst number two, the, ex the excessive slope on those greens, that golf course was built as a winter course. Now, remember when Augusta National was built, it was under the same premise, right? And yeah. I think that they have now, I mean, they're tipping to the edge on that. But the times I've been there, you know, the greens are, you know, they're, you know, 10. Don't say it. Don't half. say it. Don't say you know, it. They're not excessive. And, and so they're, they're playable for the membership. The membership doesn't, it's not like Oakmont, where Oakmont, right. I mean, they're 13 all the time, 13, right. 14 yeah. all the time. Yeah. So um, at Augusta National, you know, it's like your own club. You know, they beef it up during the club championship. And, you know, this isn't really the club championship, but uh, it's Augusta National's club championship. And they're there to, the, the, the greens are ultimately the only defense to this place. And right. we can we can talk about architecture all day long and, and, and the fence mechanisms around old the, golf courses but it's it's a i love it so. the maintenance is remarkable the place is dreamlike when you go there you go oh my god this is unbelievable it's <laughs> remarkable in so many ways but uh but uh we got to separate those categories from an architectural point of view it's a right. it's a brutal golf course to play for the masters well one of the things that has been changed you talk about them tiger proofing the golf course one of the things they did is they brought in rough and i mean i guess when you when you played there dick there was there was no rough that's right. There was no. If you hit it off the fairway, you're in the pine straw. Yeah, um, and this whole concept of tiger proofing is just an impossibility. <laughs> you actually well, sure it is. play into his favor, but they, the the changes to you know it's I would say that uh, you know there there oh gosh there's so many artificial changes and I think quite frankly um, the the founder Bobby Jones wouldn't uh, wouldn't agree to it. I mean it's just no. changed the golf course so dramatically. But um, this is something that you can you can get into a complete discussion over and spend all day talking about. Yeah, but you would concede, and I think you have already. It is a beautiful place. Yes. I mean, my recollection of walking onto the grounds. Yes. And I mentioned I mentioned this repeatedly for those that, and I guess ninety nine point nine percent of the people watching or listening to this will never go to Augusta. And that adds the value because it's restricted. You can't get there, and what you can't have, you want even more. Right. But weren't you sh the thing that shocked me the most when I walked on there was the topography, the elevation changes. You're right. Because you can't see them on television and you don't think about them. Like yeah, huge going elevation up nine changes. or 18 or um, well, all over the place. It, it's not a flat golf course by any stretch of the imagination. So those are more shocking than the pimento sandwiches? <laughs> I got to tell you another thing. I went No, no, no. To the price of the pimento the sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't the quality. <laughs> And in 2008, when I was with um, uh, Golf Canada, we, I, w I went down there as a spectator. Lego, you, you'll appreciate this. And, and being on site during the tournament on the other side of the ropes, it drove me nuts. I didn't like oh. it. I didn't like it. I wanted to get out of there because, you know, Lego, you and I, when we're at a, one of those events, I, wa I want to be on the other side of the ropes. And yeah. I'm not used to being on this side. And I remember talking to Trevor Linden when he's decided to, stop playing hockey. I said, would you ever go to a Canucks game? He goes, not in your life. <laughs> not before he was became, uh, yeah. you know, and he's not going again now either. Uh, and he's not going he's again. He's not now. going again. So <laughs> exactly. But the whole idea of, of being on this side of the ropes, I didn't want any part of it. I wanted to go home and watch the masters yeah. on TV. Um, length has become a big issue, obviously on, on the tour and, um, DeChambeau more than anybody else. Um, can you, does this golf course allow for guys who want to bomb it to bomb it? Or if you guys had that kind of power and equipment, um, would, would you be taking a lot of three woods out because of the, the nature of the golf course? I think possibly. I mean, but I, I'll tell you what, we can get into a whole, this is a, I mean, this is the discussion now as we're, you know, yeah. the game is evolving. This is an evolution in the game. This is not a, you know, any kind of groundbreaking shift. This has happened over, you know, decades and, and you know, centuries of playing the game of golf. So, um, but I think it's been interesting to me over the last few weeks on tour, if you look at venues where the defense has been, okay, we had a very, very dry Riviera. We had a very, very dry, um, uh, uh, what was the other event? Uh, sorry, I had it on. Uh, but anyway, the greens were extremely firm. Mm -hmm. And and Zoe can reiterate this, and we talk about this in the, in the evolution of the American player at the British Open. 
most guys grow up playing the golf ball in the air. They do not like to, you know, they do not like it when they can't control the ball on the ground. And, you know, when we saw what happened at Riviera and guys couldn't hit, you know, I was watching and I think on Sunday, I think it was oh, something like 23% of the players hit it on the 16th green, yeah. which is, you know, if you play, it's one of the best par threes in the world. I mean, and uh, it's a 165 yard. These guys are hitting wedges, nine irons, eight irons there. And it was a, because of the firmness of the green, you had to be very, very specific. So that is the defense mechanism right now. So I, I think when you look at the longest players in the world, if you want to shrink the field, then you soften up the golf course. If you want to open the field, you firm up the golf course. And, uh, you know, we'll see where that goes. But unfortunately, the game of golf is played outside and that variable cannot be controlled that easily. Well, what we, what we expect is um, little chance of rain and they haven't had a lot of rain at Augusta. So um, we're anticipating it's going to be hard and firm and fast. And, um, and that people think that means that the greens are going to be um, extraordinary. And that's really, um, and especially as undulating as, as they are at Augusta that that's going to be a factor, but it also pertains to the fairway um, because balls do run mm -hmm. at, at Augusta. Right. And well, go further ahead Dick. to that. When the golf course plays firm and fast and Lego's absolutely right. It is the defense of it. If you, um, Phil Mickelson was talking about last November when they played the masters, you know, hitting a shot into the second green, the ball actually plugged as it landed, like splat didn't yeah. go anywhere. If, if the players are allowed or, or, or if the golf course is playing that way, it allows the players to just play the air game and everyone on the tour is brilliant at that. But the separation happens, uh, what Lego's talking about, being firm and fast is where the ball lands is nowhere near where the ball ends up. And you have to have this knowledge of whether you're landing it in the fairway, depending on the wind, and you know the firmness that that ball is going to run 30, 40 yards, maybe, or, or kick this way or kick that way. But then you mm -hmm. have to anticipate what the yardage is, where the ball's to the land, and then what it's going to do when it hits as it relates to landing into like the 13th green, it's going to run and then take the big break. So it, 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 it forces that player to have that awareness. And if you don't have that awareness, which is a skill, you're going to be in trouble. Dick, did, hey, you go uh, and, did you go and play Augusta um, long before um, Masters Week to try I and did. get a sense of it? I did. Um, uh, I reached out to this fellow named David Culver. David Culver was the former chairman of Alcan. He's a Montreal fellow. And I reached out to him, who's a member. He's one of the only two or three Canadian members. And I went down to Augusta with him to play it. Spent the night, you know, a couple of nights there at the uh, Eisenhower cabin and nice. got the whole experience of it mm. uh, before. So when you, when you qualify to become eligible for the masters, you're actually a member, a limited member for that year that you're invited. You can take guests ah. there, but you can't, they can't play, but they can be with you. And, uh, um, I, I remember one time, one time I took played a practice round and took, a uh, uh, Jim James Deacon down with me. Remember James oh, passed away very years well. Ago. Very and, good uh, friend. And I, I I was able to bring him as a guest, and he was writing for McLean's magazine and doing an article. And uh, but he couldn't play, but he could attend there with you, which I thought was pretty cool. So during your year your year that you're invited, you can you can go and use the facility as a member with limited access, where wow. like uh, guests. I, 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 before we get into the specifics, the specifics of this tournament, I got to ask you: Did you, did you watch uh, Bryson on the practice tee with VJ watching him swing? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> that was that was. I'm not. I'm not sure. I mean, one guy has probably the smoothest, gentlest swing on the tour, and then then there was Bryson. Well, Bryson. I mean, it was fascinating to watch that. It is. It is, and Bryson's fascinating. You know, and keep in mind, I think, and I think Lego can agree with this is that you know everyone's thinking about how strong a, how how he drives the ball but his real secret in my mind and why he won the u.s open is how he putts and yeah. and no one's giving him the credit like it was remarkable how he putted those u.s open greens and if he has anywhere near close to that type of putting on this golf course with his strength with his uh, uh, length um, boy, oh boy, this could be a one-sided uh, game complete right out of the get-go if he gets on it. 
Well, let's talk about this year's Masters and uh, who we like and who we think should be at or near the top of the leaderboard. This is an exercise in futility, I concede, when it comes to <laughs> golf tournaments. But nonetheless, we'll do that when we come back. Uh, Zokal, Lego, back after this. Bob McCowan, John Shannon, Ian Leggett, Richard Zokel with us as we uh, get set for uh, tomorrow's opening round of the... Uh, and this is where, guys, this is where Bob says Justin Thomas is winning the tournament because he won last week, and it's all about momentum, and it's all about emotion. It's all <laughs> no, about it was Jordan stuff. Spieth who won last week. Oh, uh, I don't way. care. I mean, was, hey, by the way, I, I, I want to go back to... I always get I these go, two guys convinced up. I got the mix, mixed I want to go back to an earlier comment that Zoke made about when the ball lands and you don't know where it's going to end up. That's exactly how Shani plays the game, so... <laughs> 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 well for me it's for me it's when i stand up to the ball and get ready to swing i don't know where it's going to land as, all right so Ian, as you well know it's all about putting you know every time we play oh, it's all yeah, about putting man. well no for you it's all about fudging that handicap of yours but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> all right so I, I said this earlier i mean this is truth uh, the uh, the greatest exercise in futility is predicting the winner of a golf tournament it is the stupidest thing to do yes um, and yet we all do it all the time um, but here, let me, let me give you a scenario because I think in some ways, this is sort of a unique year. I mean, Oak, Tiger's not playing, but even when Tiger played and won in 19, um, he wasn't really, ex he, he wasn't really expected to, it was obviously a possibility, but wasn't really expected. I'm not sure that this year's field has ever been, or the field of the masters has ever been more wide open than it is this year. So here's the names, Jordan Spieth, Dustin Johnson, Justin Thomas, uh, Bryson DeChambeau, Brooks Kepka, and I'll throw in just for fun, Rory McIlroy, although Rory McIlroy's performance at majors lately has been surprising. Would you take those, that field of six or the rest? Personally, I, I would take that field. And the, the reason why, um, you know, I, we've talked about this before, Bob, and I love the way that Jordan Spieth has recovered from his game. And I love the fact that Justin Thomas has, if you want to call it, recovered from the incident uh, that happened and what he's been able to do from his mental makeup. I've always said this. I prefer the guy that hates to lose over the guy that likes to win. I don't know if I have not figured out Bryson DeChambeau yet in where he, what camp he fits into. Um, I'm not sure if he's a guy that loves to win or he just hates to lose. I'm not really sure just yet, but I do know for sure that the way, uh, and I know Zoke is going to love diving in on this, this uh, comment that Jordan Spieth, um, to recover from something like this. And Zoka and I know guys that have, you know, as two guys that have struggled through injuries in our life, I've got an incredible amount of respect for the guys like a Scott for Plank and a guy like Steve Stricker and a guy like Jordan Spieth and Tiger Woods. And, you're, you know, being able to rematch up the physical and the mental because the mental never goes away. It really never goes away. Every great player has a library of all the great shots that they hit in their mind. And when they put their hands on that golf club, they know it's going to happen. Now, when the physical goes away and you can't line the two up, this is where conflict happens. And for Jordan Spieth to be able to come back from that is incredible as far as I'm concerned. And that's why I kind of like him this week. I think his you know, adversity that he's been through is going to lend himself to recovering to what happened to him on that 12th hole, what, five years ago, I think it was, um, and being able to put that behind him. Because I think for him to get back to where he is right now, that is what he needed to be able to put that situation behind him. Dick, you're taking the field or the six I gave you? I'm taking the six, like Lego, uh, rather than the field, because it uh, coming down on Sunday, what it takes, the mental... Um, ability to stay in the moment, which is a very difficult thing to do. And you um, odds go way into the favor in those who have, know what that's all about in that situation. So I agree with Lego. What Spieth has done is remarkable and in, in, in his words, monumental. And, and, and the thing I'd like to 
expand on what Ian said too, as it relates to Spieth in his ascent back is his ability, like he was showing signs and he was trending this way is the term they use, shooting 61s on Saturdays and getting into contention. But when he got into contention, he's such an amped up guy that he wasn't settling down enough to actually get the job done, to take care of business. But he took care of business this past weekend on, on, with the lead and how he performed, how he drove his golf ball was exceptional. And he got into that mindset and it's literally a mindset like a perfect hand into a perfect glove. And it was done effortlessly. And that's the power that Spieth is bringing into. So I'm, I'm with Lego. I think the two guys are, are Spieth and Johnson. But uh, mm -hmm. yes, I'll take the six that you explained over the field. Well, the intriguing thing and the difference, you know, uh, Lego was talking about emotion. And um, uh, there's no doubt Spieth is motivated to win and certainly motivated to win at Augusta. DJ has now won at Augusta, but I don't sense that emotion in him. I, I think he is far more machine-like, um, less spiritual, if you will. Am I, am I misreading that, Dick? He's laid back. I mean, that's, that's how he, uh, uh, Dustin goes into everything, and it's an asset for him. It serves him well, it really well, because he's able to let things go where others can't that would drive them nuts in a post-traumatic way. So he's able to compartmentalize, be in the moment constantly. So he doesn't allow post-trauma to, to mm -hmm. hold him back. He is in post-traumatic growth mentally and, and uh, it, it serves him really well. And uh, I think he's not going to give you signs that all of a sudden he's pumped up and ready to go. That's just not Dustin Johnson. He's going to let his golf clubs do the talking. And if he gets into contention, then that's when you got to worry about him. Tiger Woods was perceived to have been able to overpower this golf course, hence, you know, de-tigerizing it. But the truth of the matter was Tiger was such a great player that um, the fact that he hit it 20 yards further than everybody else really wasn't the whole factor. Um, DeChambeau is the same kind of guy in terms of, his ability to hit it further than everybody else doesn't have, at least at this point, the skill set that Tiger had. Um, but does this golf course fit him theoretically? And we kind of touched on this earlier. Or, you know, does his length matter as much at Augusta as it does someplace else? Well, I, I think, you know, Zoke touched on it earlier. I think that it's almost like a magic trick. He's distracting us with this, you know, ball speed and everything. And we're not even looking at the other aspect of his game that got him to win at Wingfoot. I mean, he drove the ball magnificently around mm -hmm. Wingfoot. But, I mean, he left himself, you know, in areas that no different than Tiger Woods was when he came out on tour in, into an area of extreme weakness when he came out on tour which was the, the, that kind of, you know, 110 yard shot and in, and he was yeah. flawless during uh, wing foot. So um, if there's a weakness in his game, it's definitely his bunker game. It's definitely, you know, his, his pitching play. of the ball. And that has everything to do. I don't care what you talk about. You cannot chip with a five iron shaft. That's just, I don't, <laughs> that's just not going to work for anybody. So um, <laughs> we can talk about that all day long too. But uh, um, I, I think that, there isn't if he drives the ball well, and he's even he, he's even mentioned this. He lives and breathes on emotion, and if he gets going in the wrong direction, he has a very difficult time getting going in the other direction. Where a guy like Dustin Johnson, because of his mental makeup, doesn't have that issue. Yeah, Rory, well, I'd like Rory. To, go ahead, Dick. Um, I would like to add what blew me away in 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 is how Bryson DeChambeau handled Wingfoot on that Sunday when he made those putts for Eagles, yeah. like on the ninth hole, I went, Oh my God, this is, this is unreal. So if he, what will determine how, whether he plays well will be how he performs on these greens. These are Augusta national greens. It's playing firm and fast. And, and, and if he dials it in with his putter and has that, putting ability the way he did at Wingfoot last last year then um, I think you know he's bringing a gun to an, and everyone else is bringing a knife to this uh, this mm. confrontation Dick you bring up a, a really good point because 
golf because through the pandemic the one thing is, is that the the networks have done a magnificent job with the sound you know, i feel i'm hearing more golfers and more caddies than ever before uh and and what I, I was one of those guys that just perception was I didn't really like DeChambeau. But at the U.S. Open and the last couple of tournaments I've watched him play, I kind of like the guy now. Mm -hmm. his, his attitude is much more pleasant than I thought it was compulsive. Mm -hmm. And, and, the, and the, the one thing that you guys have touched on because of his emotion, his resilience, mm -hmm. his, his ability to forget that he's, you know, double bogey. 11 and you know and then, and then he then he can go three birdies in a row his ability to forget his mistakes to me uh i think makes him much more uh, attractive and enjoyable to watch as a golfer even though he's using that five iron uh, uh out, of the, <laughs> out of out of the sand trap for ian well you know he he's turned around a lot of people me included um, um, and when you looked at him a year prior to, you know, look, I'm in 1999, like he was this spontaneous human combustion. He was going crazy if he wasn't hitting it well on the driving range. And we watched that at the open championship. He's a different person now. And, and, and you can see it in his, I always look to his body language. It's an echo of what's going on in their mind, not what comes out of their mouth. And he's, he's, he's a happier person. He's, he's more comfortable in the lead. He, he, he isn't ready to pop. Um, uh, and, and, you know, so he's, he's releasing his emotions. And I think that has, people pick up on that. And I think that's what's causing you, John, to turn around and like it. That's exactly what happened to me as well. And he's fascinating. I don't think, and the good thing is too, in my opinion, is, is that I don't think people can copy that. He's an anomaly and, uh, and uh, he's, a, he's a tremendous value to the people. For professional, I think too, so I think I think when we look at the the prior incidents that he's had on tour too, I think he's matured. He's maturing yes. right in front of our eyes. We look yes. at the incidents of him marching off greens, not shaking guys' hands, right. acting like a child. I think he's learned his lessons, and we have to respect that. I mean, totally. not everybody's perfect, and this lends itself but exactly a, a to TPC, Justin, Justin Thomas. A TPC, and he was the most likable guy that I watched all, all weekend. I just had fun watching. I, I had fun watching him, not just for the way he hit the golf ball, but for, and I also, I think I appreciated his short game too, as Dick was talking about, but I had fun. I really enjoyed his personality, his interaction with his caddy. Um, you know, it was, it was just, a, it was a revelation for me. Well, yeah, this evolution, uh, the evolution of a per, of a, the personality of a of a golfer on the PGA Tour is not unique. Uh, Jack Nicklaus was uh, disliked and sullen in the early part of his career, mm -hmm. partly because I think you know because Arnold was there and everybody loved Arnold, and so therefore they had to hate Jack. Mm -hmm. Tiger evolved; his personality evolved over the course of his career. You know, you could argue he wasn't all that likable in the early part, but I want to get to before we let you guys go. Uh, one of the names on that of the six that I gave you is an intriguing one. Rory McIlroy looked like um, coming out of the gate, he was going to be um, the best player in the world and maybe by a long shot and who knows, maybe almost another Tiger. Um, and he, he has weeks where he plays well, but he has not played well in majors for quite some time. And his real bugaboo has been opening rounds. He has had more mid to high 70 opening rounds at major championships than you really would expect. Um, where do you think he's at? And is, is there, is there some reason and can anybody explain why Rory McIlroy over and over shoots 74, 75 and opening rounds of majors and then, and then tries to come back? Well, you know, I, I think if we, if we turn it toward Augusta national and I, I, I think again, he's puts a lot of pressure on himself this week is the only major that he doesn't own. Um, and we, and we, if, if we reflect back to the first time the world got introduced to Rory McIlroy and he shot 81 in that last right. round and, and how emotional he was about that. So there's some scar tissue there that he needs to figure out. The good thing about Rory McIlroy though, and, and Zoe can tell you about this, is where Bryson DeChambeau is the opposite. Bryson DeChambeau, every player has a certain amount of shots or swings or, you know, contact that they make that needs to validate to them that they have it right. and everybody's got a number you know it might be 10 might be a thousand 
And a player will say, like a Justin Rose is a perfect example. Justin Rose will, ha will have four or five really amazing practice sessions, and he's got it. Roy McElroy needs to hit one shot, and he knows that he has it. He doesn't have it right now. Now, does that mean that any certain point between now and Thursday morning, does he find it or has he found it? I don't know. But that's the way he plays the game. You look at the way that his career has evolved, the roles he gets on, the times he's been world number one to dropping to two, three, four, five, six, back to world number one. He's That's just the way that he plays the game. He mm. is the opposite of the scientist. He's the field player. He's the guy I like. He's the Seve Ballesteros and Lee Trevino. He's the, that's the guy I like to play. And yeah, you can also like the scientist. Doesn't matter. People hate Nick Faldo, you know, and the way he approached the game. I'm not that kind of person. I love to see the flair in the game and Roy McElroy's that guy. So does he have it? I don't know. We'll wait and see, but Roy McElroy's not done. He's far from being done. To answer your question, Bob, I, I think it's a <clears throat> it's a mental um, perspective in 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 how he's evolved. So he's won all these majors except the Masters. He's trying to win that Grand Slam. I mean, look at how he opened up that first round in at the Open Championship in Ireland a couple of years ago with a quad and shoots shoots himself right out of it it's a mindset it's his expectations it's what you know we're watching justin thomas talk about he's pushing hard to win this is exactly what rory's doing his expectations he, he's talking openly about how he how he doesn't want his personal identity to be identity to be attached to how he plays these are all mental perspectives and when your expectations that he has to win the Masters in order to get to the Grand Slam. He has to win the Open Championship at home. These are the things that get professional golfers into trouble when they when they start to project forward and get these expectations. They they don't know they're doing it, and they don't know how destructive it is and how what kind of a barrier it has. And they've got to hit rock bottom before they can then rebound up. It's 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 happens in, in lots in life and, and a lot in other sports as well. I think well, when you look at it too, Bob, I think too, to, to Richard's point, I think when you dig deep down into the archives of, you know, the soul of great golfers and you look at a guy like Phil Mickelson, perfect. He's the, he's exactly the same person. This, you know, his career is over as far as winning major championships. But if you dug deep down enough, he's not going to talk about the masters he won. He's going to talk about the U S open. He didn't win. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, guys, fascinating. Um, it is, um, it's the best time of the year for me. Um, it means the beginning of the golf season for most of us. And pimento before. sandwiches. <laughs> and pimento cheese sandwiches. For well, they're two bucks now, Bob. So I don't know. Well, if I know. Inflation oh. has kicked in everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Fortuitously, will cover you. <laughs> Fortuitously, the, the fee that you're getting for this program, Lego, has remained exactly the same as it has for years and years. <laughs> Half a pimento uh, sandwich. It's, <laughs> it's great seeing both of you and having a chance to chat with you. Hopefully, we'll get a chance to do it again uh, soon. Uh, thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thank Wonderful you, Lego. to be with you guys. Appreciate the opportunity. Enjoyed it, fellas. Bye-bye. Ian Leggett, Richard Zokel, back after this. Bob McCowan, John Shannon. So you're, you're picking Spieth, right? Um, I am. Um, and part of it is because I like the kid and, um, DJ leaves me cold. I admire, I look at, I, I admire the, the, the skill set of, of the guys that we talked about. Uh, I like Justin Thomas too. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'd probably, he'd be okay. DeChambeau, I haven't warmed up to yet. Um, <laughs> he's, he's fun to watch. He, I, I, I'll give you that. Yeah. Kepka has the best record uh, for majors of the last while. I don't know how healthy Kepka is. Um, he leaves me cold too. I think he has the personality of a of a, of a kitchen table. Mm -hmm. And I just I I don't think Rory uh, McIlroy is. Um, I don't think his game is in shape. And um, so I think Spieth and Thomas, which would be interesting because these are two pretty good friends, right? I think we're going to see a repeat, Bob. I think we are. I think Dustin Johnson is going to win again. Why? Well, I, first of all, I, I think that uh, once you've won there, 
Uh, I think there be, it becomes, there's a lot more confidence in the game you play on the golf course. And I, and I think that his game matches perfectly for this golf course. He can well, move along. Say- his, his short game, his putting is going to be fine. I think Dustin Johnson wins. Two things. What you saw in October is going to have nothing to do with what you're going to see in the spring. Those are two entirely different golf courses. But mm-hmm. DJ has played well there historically. Yes. Yes. I think he finished second. When he's or not third. falling, when he's not falling downstairs. Yeah. Besides the 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 wind. So mm-hmm. I can't argue with you to tell you the honest to goodness truth. Uh, in any event, for those of you that are interested, and why wouldn't you be? It uh, all begins uh, bright and early uh, tomorrow morning, and three Canadians in the field. Uh, yeah. this year to keep an eye on again our thanks to uh, Leggett and Zokel for uh, Shannon and McCowan we'll see you again tomorrow goodbye everybody and hey. I won't see you again tomorrow well no I meant tomorrow no I know I'm just I was I know I know uh, <laughs> okay. so uh, it is uh, 10 a.m on Friday morning with uh, Pang and Millen sounds good Millen. Where do I recognize that name? Greg Millen, Darren Greg Pang, Millen. Friday morning. Yeah. Okay. My dad knows Greg Millen. See you boys. Well. Okay, guys, I'm off too. I got shows that fair. See you later, guys. See you. Yeah. All right. Thanks. See you, you Friday. Bye-bye. No problem.